Today's show is sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company. For a fraction of the price of traditional therapy, you can pick an experienced licensed therapist that you relate to and feel comfortable with. To match with your perfect therapist, go to Talkspace.com slash conversations. And as a listener of this show, you get $30 off your first month by using the offer code conversations when you visit Talkspace.com slash conversations. Today's show is also sponsored by Mack Weldon Underwear, smartly designed with premium fabrics and, best of all, a simple shopping experience. They even have a line of silver underwear and shirts that eliminate odor. Pretty cool. Best of all, it's shipped right to your door, and if you don't like your first pair, you keep it. As a listener of this show, you get 20% off your first purchase by going to MacWeldon.com slash conversations. All right, friends, let's do it. Hey, I'm Dylan Marin, and this is Conversations with People Who Hate Me, the show where I usually call up some of the folks who have sent me negative or hateful messages on the internet. Don't worry, this is just the conclusion for now. I'll be cooking up some new stuff for you very soon. Think of this as the end of a chapter and not the end of a whole book. So to close this chapter, I won't be calling up people who hate me at all, but actually the people who love the show and wrote to tell me about it. And okay, before you barf on yourself about how self-indulgent that sounds, it isn't. I promise it's less about compliments and more about how a bunch of people around the world are using this podcast in their own life. We'll meet a man in Argentina who was motivated to have a difficult conversation with his girlfriend after listening to the show, uh, the school teacher who's using this podcast as a lesson plan, and even the local politician in coal country, Pennsylvania. And at the end of the episode, you'll hear from a conservative listener who says he agrees more with my guests than he does with me. And yet, he is still a fan. Before we get into those calls, I wanted to start by thanking my guests. Yeah, the eight people who sent me the negative or hateful messages that allowed this podcast to happen in the first place. We started with Chris, the Trump supporter who called me a piece of shit in a Facebook message. Let me take that back. Let me take that back. I didn't mean to call you a piece of shit. I apologize for calling you a piece of shit. You met Josh, a soon-to-be graduating high school senior who online said I was a moron, but in our call revealed to me that he got bullied all throughout high school. Josh, you said that you're about to graduate high school, right? Mm-hmm. How is high school for you? Am I allowed to use the H-E double hockey stick word? Oh, yeah, you're allowed to. It was hell. <laughs> really? And it's still hell right now, even though it's only two weeks left. And to keep it balanced, that was followed up by Matthew, a fellow gay liberal who publicly dragged me by claiming that I represented the worst aspects of liberalism. He later admitted that he had been publicly dragged himself. Matthew, you posted this pretty publicly, and you also tagged me in it, so I saw it right when you posted it. Have you ever been publicly dragged? I have been. And I just said, no, I don't care. And did you not care? Oh, well, I cared, yes. <laughs> there was Anna, a woman who told me that facts didn't care about my feelings, and uh, we found some surprising common ground. Even last night, I was, you know, engaging in intellectual discussion, hopefully, on Facebook, uh-huh. and I was called a, I was called a racist. I, I have a picture of me and my cat on, on Facebook, and <laughs> I was told to go have sex with my cat. Like, that's yeah. so not necessary. No. Also, uh, a cat cannot consent, so I would appreciate that you did not have sex with your cat. Please don't do that. And I wouldn't consent to that either. Okay, great. So. Look, we found our common ground. We don't think you should have sex with your cat. Yay! And then there was Bradley, a kind, devout Christian who said he didn't hate me at all, but only hated the sin of homosexuality, which he tried to explain was an addiction that I could cure. It it sounds like I'm an asshole, but it's it's just what I what I believe, and it's it's not fair. It, It it's not. But if you look at the Bible and you go with the different parts, like yes, it is not acceptable. But there's also things that I do that are unacceptable. James, a stand-up comedian from Australia, told me I was condescending as fuck in a comment, but then opened up about the state he was in when he wrote the comment. I was probably drunk and on and on drugs. Like alcohol is like the hardest thing to to give up. But I haven't I haven't uh, had a drink for a long time now. After saying online that I was an idiot and the reason people think all gay men are fairies and flaming queens, Lee, a gay man himself, shared some surprising details about his life. 
my father was shot and killed when I was 21 months old. It was actually, from what I'm told, was he was actually shot mainly because of me. And finally, there was E, who told me to kill myself in a public comment. Turns out that sentiment hit closer to home for him than I would have ever thought. I'd rather not go into the specifics, but I, I had, it was a time in my life, you know, I was 14 or whatever, and I would, you know, almost kind of try to kill myself. So, these were the eight people who made up my guests. I'm grateful to know them beyond the digital negativity they sent my way. And I respect them too. I mean, it takes guts to publicly own up to something you wrote on the internet, and they did. There were so many people I invited to be on the show who rejected the invitation immediately. Some never responded, even though I saw they read it. And some people even agreed to be on the show, but then blocked me when they feared it was a setup. Before we get on with this episode, there is one frequent question that I want to publicly answer. A bunch of people have asked why this show is called Conversations with People Who Hate Me when every one of my guests have said they don't hate me. Well, that's technically true, because at the end of our calls, all of my guests have all said that no, they don't hate me. But to be real, getting negative comments online can feel like hate. I've been on my way to a meeting when a notification informs me that someone thinks I'm a moron and I'll quickly have to rebuild my confidence I temporarily lost so that the comment doesn't follow me into the meeting. I've woken up after a great night of sleep and rolled over to my nightstand only to see that someone somewhere in the world thinks that I'm a piece of shit and wrote to me to share that thought. I don't recommend starting your day like that. And after sharing a piece of work I feel particularly proud of, I might scroll down to the comments to see what people are saying. When I see that someone thinks I'm an idiot and three people have liked that comment, I gotta tell you, the first thing that comes to my head isn't, well, I should keep making creative work. So without the benefit of an extended conversation, these comments do feel like hate. So there's that answer. And for those of you thinking, Dylan, just get off the internet. It's an awful place. Well, I disagree. And here is why. Hello? Hi, is this Chris? Uh, yes, this is. Uh, do you go by Christopher or Chris? Which do you prefer? Um, Chris, it's shorter. Chris reached out to me after the eighth episode of the podcast when I told my guests that I thought that being in touch with your emotions wasn't a weakness but a strength. I'm currently working with a life coach to try and improve myself. And the, at least preliminarily, they believe myself to be on the autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I often find that I have trouble in a lot of social situations and dealing with feedback from people and I respond really negative and think, oh, I just need to be stronger. And then you were saying that being in touch with your emotions it isn't a weakness, yeah. that that actually is something positive and that sort of and that really connected with me. You've been kind of helping me in you've been kind of helping me by proxy because one of the things that one of the things that's been happening is that there's been trying to develop a coping, me a coping mechanism for me when I've had bad days mm. to just be able to talk through s stuff with someone, but sometimes you just can't talk through things. And so what I've actually been imagining being doing is actually being just imagined being on your show and just having you listen to me. Oh my God. And just that's just really helped because when I get up above a certain anxiety level, I tend to get into a bit of a cycle. Mm -hmm. And so all I'm just left alone is with my own bad thoughts. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have anywhere to go. And so then what I can what I sometimes do is I will just I will just imagine that all I'm doing is just talking through everything that's been going on that's been going on and why I'm feeling this way. It's able to use you as almost as a friendly voice to then just be able to know that you're not to imagine someone just sitting there and listening to it. I definitely relate to Chris about the anxiety. Producing this show has made me more anxious than I ever anticipated, and my cool-down method was home renovation shows. Oof, a tight turnaround on a fixer-upper, a blanket, and a snack. That's my ideal Saturday night. So I also heard from a man named James, an elected official in central Pennsylvania. Well, um, I come from right outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, I went to college about an hour and a half northwest of there. And while I was there, I switched to political science oh, and wow. decided to run for borough council. I was able to actually win, mm -hmm. beating a two-term incumbent. And uh, that's, oh that's where I sit now. Whoa. Uh, James, congratulations. So I, thank you. Yeah, I was the first student in the state system of higher education to be elected. 
we are um, a college town that also has deep roots in the coal industry. What really hit hit home for me when listening to um, your podcast was the conversations that you were having were the same ones that I was witnessing in my everyday life. I also got an email from a man named Dave. The subject line was, I'm a straight white man, dot, 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 thank you. So I set up a call with him. Hello, this is Dave. Oh, hey, Dave. How are you? It's Dylan Marin. Hey, Dylan, how are you? I'm good. Look, we finally made it on the phone. We did. You got off the subway. To quickly explain, I had to cancel my initial call with Dave because I was stuck on the subway. He graciously understood. So, Dave, hi. You wrote me a very sweet email, and the subject line of that email was, I'm a straight white male, dot, 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 thank you. <laughs> so, um, Dave, <laughs> yeah. uh, what inspired you to write that sweet message? Well, I mean, if I'm being brutally honest, mm -hmm. um, I come from, like, you know, I come from, uh, you know, middle class, upper middle class, um, you know, white community. You know, with everything that's going on, it's good to actually hear people having these conversations. Are there any, like, difficult conversations in your community or, or with people you know that you've either been putting off or you feel that you need to have? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess immediately for me would be, um, my family. My dad is pretty ultra conservative. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you and your dad talk about politics or kind of where do you talk about politics? Uh, <laughs> uh usually it, <laughs> it basically only comes up when we're drinking and that's like the worst time to bring it up. But, <laughs> right, right. You're a little um, lubricated so that, and you're like, fuck it, I'll say it. Yeah. So Dave unknowingly hit on a huge theme of the listener emails I've received. So many people told me about how this show related to their relationship with their fathers. Here's Brantley. After every episode, I just I was I feel like I was about to explode with thoughts and uh, and feeling. It just it, it was triggering um, for me because uh, I'm I'm you know I came out. Uh, I mean, uh, nine years ago, uh, but I'm, I'm still, I mean, I have to come out to my dad at least once a year. It's, it's a yearly ritual and, uh, it's, it's one of those things where he, you know, chooses to not, uh, accept it, I guess. Uh, and so therefore things are never really discussed or talked about. I've, I've always kind of had to be silent about my sexuality with my younger siblings. And my dad's argument has always been, you know, they're too young. They don't know yet. It's, uh, I'm trying to, I don't know how they're going to respond to it, you know, which is ridiculous. And, uh, but I think at the time I didn't, I was just kind of in this whole like, well, you know, it's my dad. I want to respect him and I don't understand it, but whatever. And so I kind of lived in that for a while. Uh, and then finally it's, it was kind of like, no, this isn't right. Like this isn't okay. The podcast has been a very useful tool for me to talk to my dad in a way that, uh, gets, gets my, I'm able to stand up for how I feel and what I think. Uh, and also not, uh, you know, even though at times I definitely want to, uh, not yell and, you know, make things worse to where we're just arguing and yelling at each other and screaming. <laughs> and I, and it's, it's interesting because I feel like it's, he's, there's a change there in, in the, the tone of our conversations. You know, it's, it's usually, it's, uh, in the past it's been, um, I'll bring something up, whether it's an example of, being ignored when I go home for the holidays or uh, not being acknowledged. I, it's, it's kind of, it, it's up to him. He knows where I stand. He knows my door is always open, but it's, it's, you know, I told him, I was like, look, you got to do the, do the reaching out here. I mean, you're the, you're the dad, you know? And here's Natasha who also thought about the podcast in a really tough moment with her dad. Um, well, I've been listening to the podcast, uh, religiously. And, um, I thought about it because I was recently back in New York visiting, uh, for, for work and to see friends and family. And I had dinner with my father. Um, and just a little background, I'm multiracial. My father is white. Uh, my mother is black and Brazilian. Um, but so he's my white parent. 
at, at dinner with my father, uh, he sort of just made a very flippant comment that that made me uncomfortable, uh, but didn't didn't come off to me as a um, hateful comment, just ignorant. Um, and I sort of very calmly um, called him out on it. I was just like, hey, hey, that's a little bit racist. Maybe don't say that. And his response was actually far more upsetting than the actual comment that that I was responding to. Um, he sort of like jumped into this like extremely defensive, uh, how dare you call me a racist, which isn't what I said. I said that was a racist thing to say. I, I waited a day and sent him an email. And uh, a week later, he responded with almost like an um, like out of office automated message that was mm-hmm. like, I'm too busy right now to read your email. It may take me a week or two. Honestly, uh, listening to your, your podcast has been uh, helpful, especially when thinking about the situation and the way that I've sort of uh, attempted to engage with the situation and not just write my father (laughs) off as a terrible person. Um, Because it's sort of uh, hearing sort of similar things come out of the mouths of these strangers that you're sort of engaging with. uh, It's just reminding me that no matter what every, like my my father's a human, uh, which means that he can make, terrible mistakes just as these people have uh and if you're able to like have a civil conversation with with strangers who just said horrible things to you that I can hopefully have the patience uh to continue to try to do that with my father to like get things back on track um so in that way it's been hugely uh therapeutic and also just like a good reminder to me that um sort of how how much how much work we have to do, but also um, how important that work is in general. So Natasha's bringing something up that hits pretty close to home for me. A lot of the unofficial training I had for this show was through conversations I would have with my mom. And no, my mom had never written a hateful comment about me on the internet. She's an amazing queen and definitely listening to this. So hi, mom. I love you so much. But our early conversations about race uh, were very difficult. I'm biracial, and my mom is white, and as I know from many of my other multiracial friends, there's this unique discomfort that comes from the early talks between white parents and their non-white children that deal with race. So if I had to think back to where I cut my teeth on practicing these difficult conversations, I'd certainly count those late nights around our dining room table. But just to see if she's cool with me sharing this, I'm going to quickly ask her right now. Hey, hold on. I'm putting on my headset. Okay. Hey. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. Um, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, I, in the podcast, um, so I was going to talk about how, like, kind of my training ground for having difficult conversations was the conversations we had about race. Are you comfortable with that? Of course I am, sweetie. Yes. Oh my gosh. That doesn't feel invasive at all? Or, no. or you feel okay with that being on the airwaves? Oh my God, yes. Okay. Because we did have oh, difficult yeah. conversations about race. We did. We did, but I wish... I had been able to have them earlier. I yeah, wish but that's I okay. We're all humans to... and we're living our best lives, you know? Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, no, totally. I was wondering if you wanted to record the the throw to the ad and then the coming back from the ad for the podcast. Sure. Um, well, you mean the throw to the ad like saying, and now it's time for our sponsor? Yeah, exactly that. Yeah? Uh-huh. Oh, my gosh, sure. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to. Um, well, I have some news for you. I've been recording this conversation so that you already did it. You don't have to do anything else. <laughs> That's great. Support for conversations with people who hate me comes from me undies. You want to look good in your underwear and be comfortable, right? But that perfect balance is hard to find. Well made from a sustainably sourced, naturally soft fabric that is three times softer than cotton, MeUndies will be the most comfortable pair of underwear you will own. It's just soft and eco-friendly, and there's a 100% satisfaction guarantee. 
Can't beat it. And right now, MeUndies has an exclusive offer for just my listeners. Get 20% off your first pair plus free shipping. And don't forget about the 100% satisfaction guarantee. Just go to MeUndies.com slash conversations to get 20% off free shipping and the 100% satisfaction guarantee on the best, softest underwear you'll ever own. That's MeUndies.com slash conversations. This is a limited time offer, so what are you waiting for? Start wearing the best underwear of your life. It changed my life, and it's time to let MeUndies change yours. Go to MeUndies.com slash conversations right now. Support for this episode also comes from Away. Away offers high-quality luggage that is designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel. Available in a variety of colors and four sizes, including carry-on sizes that are compliant with all major U.S. airlines, the Away suitcase is lightweight and made with premium German polycarbonate that is unrivaled in strength and impact resistance. Not to mention, it features a TSA-approved combination lock, four 360-degree spinner wheels, and a patent-pending compression system to help over packers. I am one of them. Better yet, both sizes of the carry-on are available to charge anything that's powered by a USB cord. A single charge will power your iPhone five times. They just sent me one of the suitcases, and I have to say, it's the fanciest suitcase I have ever owned. And also, my phone always dies right at the airport, right before I'm about to get on a plane, the worst time when all you want to do is listen to your audiobooks or your podcasts. And this way, I don't have to worry about that. I can just charge my phone on the go. Try out Away for 100 days, you know, vibe with it, travel with it. You can Instagram it if you want, and if at any point you decide it's not for you, just return it for a full refund. Shipping is free within the lower 48 states. And thanks to Away's lifetime warranty, if anything breaks, they'll fix it, so you've really got nothing to lose. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash conversations and use promo code conversations during checkout. That's awaytravel.com slash conversations, promo code conversations for $20 off your Away suitcase. Cool. What, what else can I do? Um, <laughs> you can then throw back to uh, the the show after the ads. I would love to. Okay, can you just practice <laughs> and now let's get back to the show? And now let's get back to the show. That was great. Yeah? Yeah, you did it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm a star. Another cool thing I learned from listener emails was that this podcast was being used in high school classrooms. I'm a teacher and I've so I listened to it mm-hmm. and it actually fit to what I was teaching in school. I'm in central Washington, pretty small town, farm town. Um, I teach freshmen and sophomores mm-hmm. and my sophomores are actually learning right now how to write a podcast, oh. which is pretty cool. Wow. That's so, a, <laughs> that that was, is yeah, the most, oh my God. I When I was a freshman and sophomore, a podcast wasn't even like a, a word that existed yeah. in the zeitgeist <laughs> or at all. Yeah. It's kind of incredible and and then my freshmen, I teach them what social justice is in mm-hmm. the spring. Mm-hmm. And then actually your podcast is pretty much what their final is to learn to have a conversation with a person with the exact opposite beliefs of them. So I've taught that unit a couple times and it was a little difficult to teach it without offending my students hmm. because I have a pretty diverse group of students, mm-hmm. um, everything from um, extremely conservative to extremely liberal. And mm-hmm. I have, um, everything from, uh, straight white students to mm-hmm. students in the process of, um, a transition. Oh, wow. Um, gender change. Yeah. This is all and in so one was, classroom. Uh, yes. Oh my God. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And so that was a, that was the whole point of teaching social justice is so they, they know where they stand. Your podcast is really helpful because it's significantly more relatable to them oh, um, and what's going on in their lives. And it turns out a psychology professor is using it as well. What inspired you to reach out to me about the podcast? I'm a, a professor of clinical psychology, so I, I teach other psychologists or uh, psychologists in training. Hmm. Um, and I thought that what you were doing had a number of uh, things that were skills and uh, characteristics that were applicable psychologists. So I, I, I did um, bring it into my class as well. Oh. You know, when I'm listening to the podcast, I feel my 
heart skip a little bit as the Skype sound is is going and you're calling these people after they said these very difficult or uh, hurtful mm-hmm. um, things. And I kind of noticed that emotional arousal mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and in psychotherapy, um, that same internal experience is happening. Essentially, you're having uh, difficult conversations. Mm. Um, so I think that that is what I connected with most, the importance of having difficult conversations for the purpose of achieving some goal. This podcast apparently made its way around the world. Here's a listener from Argentina. Hi, Dylan. Hi, how are you? Is this Fede? Yes. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. I'm really excited to do this. Uh, also a little nervous, but mostly excited. Oh, don't be nervous. Like, the more you you are, the better. Okay, okay. Uh, I wanted to first start uh, by apologizing to you and all your listeners, because I'm going to totally murder the English language. I'm going to invent some words. That's okay. It's a colonial language anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so you know what? It needed its comeuppance. So so I'm, I'm happy with however you interpret the English language. Thanks. I am really excited because uh, I, I really liked the idea of your show. Mm-hmm. At first, I have to be sincere. At first, when I first uh, heard the trailer, I first thought it, that it wasn't a stupid idea. <laughs> I said, oh no, this is going to go so bad, bad. But you really surprised me. Oh, uh, wow. Well, thank you. So this yes. podcast has traveled all the way down the globe to uh, Argentina. That's pretty amazing. Yes, yes. I'm not the only one here who listens to the podcast. Uh, oh, some of my friends do too. Wow. Well, hello, Argentina. Maybe that's the title of my next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Fede, you wrote to me, um, I think like a few weeks ago. Um, yes. What inspired you to write to me? So the thing is, I have a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And let's call her Jackie mm-hmm. to keep her anonymous. Of course, Jackie. Um, we love each other. Mm-hmm. We really love each other. We share a lot of things. But we have really different worldviews. At first, we decided really not to talk about them. Mm-hmm. But uh, it started to become a problem. Mm-hmm. And I first thought that, well, there's there was no way about it that we, were, we had just really different uh, views and there was nothing we could agree on and it, there was no sense in, in in talking. But when I, I listened to your podcast, mm-hmm. I, I thought, well, if, if, he could, if he could talk to all these people who, well, they are clearly in the opposite sides of, of uh, the of thought the thought line, what whatever you can call it, and I said, well, okay, this is my chance. So we started talking, and it I had to admit it was really awkward. Uh, it's still awkward, mm-hmm. but it's okay. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it has it has to be. It's okay for it to to be awkward. It's okay to, uh, as you said, uh, not have like uh, a, a happy ending with a that with a ribbon right, to right, tie right, right. The conversation and and uh, but uh, having those differences is part of what I don't know makes human nature beautiful, isn't it? And here's Mina, a listener from Germany. So Mina, here we are. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Uh, yeah. Are you a yeah. little nervous? Yeah, a bit. Okay, don't be nervous. I'm look, yeah. I'm just a human on Skype. Here I am. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's just um uh, uh about the language, you know? It's mm-hmm. uh, always a bit different to to uh speak up in uh, in I a totally another language. That. So you're doing great, um, but you don't need Thanks. my approval. Um so Mina, where where am I speaking to you right now? Where where are you? Yeah, I'm in uh, Berlin, in uh, Germany. We are in really different times at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it all started uh, to get really, really bad about two years ago Mm -hmm. when uh, the Syrian war was on, on, uh, on the top point and 
there were coming a lot of refugees to Europe and especially to Germany and mm. um, and uh, our Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, decided to open um, the borders and to get uh, and let more refugees in and uh, help help them and a lot of people uh, didn't like it and hmm. they were probably some were just scared mm -hmm. but the, the most people got very racist I started to to avoid difficult conversations mm -hmm. um, it started it started uh, with my family and with my friends and every time when there were political terms I just stand quiet and mm -hmm. I was so tired, you know, I mm. was so tired of always speaking up against them and, and standing alone with it. And I uh, found out about your podcast uh, in a Facebook ad and uh, there was a video showing up on my timeline and I thought uh, this looks interesting <laughs> and I listened and I listened to it and, and I was... Um, I was really surprised about how you could talk so nicely to these people and so open-minded and um, yeah, that, it really impressed me. I thought we have to talk, you know, yeah. we, we have to talk to each other and, and we just can't stand it like it, like it is at the moment. And I think maybe maybe just talking will not um, will not uh, is, is not the answer for everything, but I think it is a start. I also got to hear from Joe in Israel. Yes, I know. I found your podcast through Welcome to Night Vale, mm -hmm. and by the time I listened to the episode that promoted your podcast, there were about three episodes out, mm -hmm. and I listened to all of them in a row. Um, and I was just really touched by it. I don't know if I can say exactly why. Well, I, I'm out to all my friends and they're fine with me. Mm -hmm. Or I wouldn't still be friends with them. And I'm not out to my family and that's okay hmm. for now. Mm -hmm. But at work, I'm out and I work with a lot of uh, not so friendly people. Hmm. So, you know, I've had a lot of that type of conversation, but never quite as calmly as you do. Mm -hmm. And it was just really nice to hear someone having that sort of conversation and, I guess, getting somewhere. You know, it really is cool to hear that this show has been accessible to people all around the world. But when I initially hoped that this podcast would travel far, I wasn't only thinking in the metrics of miles, but also how far it could travel ideologically. Could it reach people with different views? Was this podcast ever going to reverberate past the liberal echo chambers that I occupy? Well, I got that answer from George. Hello. Oh, hey, is this uh, George? Yes, it is. Oh, we finally got it to work. This is exciting. <laughs> um, so, George, uh, right after we released the first episode, uh, you sent me a very, very sweet uh, Facebook message. And something you said in the Facebook message really stuck out to me. You said, I would say I am more similar to the people you call than yourself, uh, and then you said a lot of nice things about the podcast. So, George, what uh, what inspired you to reach out? The, the first thing I, I really do appreciate about what you're doing is that there is no hostility. There's no attacking. It's just straight listening and trying to have a conversation about things that need to be talked about. You said um, that you are more like some of the people I talk to than you are like me. Um, so in only as many details as you're comfortable sharing, uh, tell me about you. Um. I, I guess I, and that was I was more referring to the social justice warrior aspect. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I definitely don't uh, uh, would consider myself that. I mean, I I served in the army. Mm -hmm. I, uh, although I do live in California, I I, uh, I love my guns. I love all that kind of stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Proud supporter of the Second Amendment. I am. Mm -hmm. This type of activism that you're doing now, I feel, will reach a lot more people because I've. Everything people see on the media and everything else, it's 
it's hype, it's for entertainment, it's not actual to reach anybody. I feel what you're doing is will benefit the cause way more than anyone is doing currently. Um, and so what is your take on what's going on in the NFL right now with people taking a knee during the national anthem? I, I personally feel it's, a, it's an unnecessary disrespect to the country. I just don't understand why that is the way they, wanted, they chose to promote their cause. I mean, I, I have no problem with people protesting false bad things that are going on in society. I mean, mm -hmm. protesting has changed society for the better hmm. in many ways throughout history. So it's not the fact that they're protesting that's upsetting. It's just the way they're doing it and who they're protesting because it's not the flag. It's not the United States that's, I guess, oppressing them or whatever it is. I mean, if it's the local police or if it's, you know, if they feel it's just the legislation or what, whatever they feel is the cause of it is the problem, not the greater thing. Yeah. So, so not to put words in your mouth, but only to kind of confirm what you're saying. Uh, oh. You prefer this podcast as a form of activism to the idea of taking a knee during the national anthem. I do. I prefer it because I feel like it, it will uh, change people's minds. It's not going to be an immediate shutdown. I don't like this. I'm not going to listen to this guy because he's an idiot. Yeah. I mean, the the kind of the way I see it. Um, is kneeling during the national anthem is only a symbolic way of talking about something. I don't think they're protesting the flag. I don't think they're protesting the anthem. The way I see it is like Colin Kaepernick is protesting the injustice against black people, which is like uh, one in the same as like the founding history of this country. I mean, I, I felt when... Kaepernick started this whole thing off. I felt if he would have went to the chief of police in San Francisco and said, I want to get together with you, your department, I'll bring my team and we'll try to get some of the people from the city to come out for a barbecue and, a, you know, just a, a day of games at a park or whatever and just kind of keep that thing up and mm. have that come in. And I mean, I think that relationship that would be built would do worlds more than what they're doing right now. Well, I I one hundred percent agree with part of that sentiment, <laughs> which is which is that um, that doing that would be very helpful, right? Um, what I do disagree with uh, is that it's the only way. Um, so, for example, while it is incredibly flattering to me that you uh, think that this podcast is a better form of activism um, than uh, than the taking a knee, uh, I I have to uh, respectfully decline that almost because I feel like they don't even need to be compared. Like so, and here's why I think this. Um, I think symbolic activism as taking the knee is symbolic activism, just like, um, you know, to bring up the uh, very famous one is like Rosa Parks, right? Rosa Parks sitting on the front of a bus that I think both you and I would agree uh, was a good thing to do, um, was the symbolic act of activism that started a bigger conversation, Right. Um, I mean, do, I don't want to. No, I mean, yeah. I, I, and that's, I mean, in that example, I mean, it's perfect. Cause I, I believe that was something mm -hmm. that was very justified for her. But in doing that, she was not disrespecting anybody else except, you know, the feelings of the white people who were upset with her sitting there. I don't know. I don't know. I, because I, I just feel like what I really wish. Uh, was that the same platforms of media were around now as, as when Rosa Parks uh, <laughs> took a seat on the bus? Because I think you would be seeing the same exact stuff, right? I think the commentators at the time uh, were like, she's disrespecting order. She's disrespecting tradition. You know what I mean? And like... Yeah. And that would have been hard for them to kind of wrap their heads around. Whereas like through... After like the distance of time, it feels like everyone everyone is in full agreement, except for you know horrendous people <laughs> that what Rosa Parks did was right. And I really do believe that like one day there will be a statue to Colin Kaepernick, and will <laughs> and everyone will be focusing on whether or not 
like everyone will 100% agree, of course, except for the horrendous people, that Colin Kaepernick was an American hero and he politely kneeled um, just to just to start the dialogue of injustice. But oh my God, these kids today, they're just brats and they're spoiled <laughs> people. I really believe that, it, you know? No, it, it, it's not, it's not a far-fetched hope. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I, Pray that there will never be a statue of Colin Kaepernick, but okay. <laughs> but maybe you'll change your mind. I don't. Want, I just. I want you to be open to that, but I don't want to force it on you because here we are. And that's why I said I believe you are going to change more minds because I mean, obviously, the national attention that he's getting, mm-hmm. he'll reach more people. But I believe will change less minds. And again, that is like. Truly, so flattering to hear uh, that I would even be compared with um, a national figure like that. But again, like I, I think, I think they, you need kind of both types of social activism. Because I see, I definitely see this podcast as a form of social activism, but I don't think it's the only one. You know what I mean? Like I, I think even you could argue that I shouldn't be just, you know, uh, broadcasting my, uh, you know phone conversations that I have with people who send me hate messages. Why don't I get out in the streets and make a change of my own? And I've gotten those emails. I've, I, I got an email from someone that said uh, she really did not like the podcast. And she said that if I uh, really cared about social justice, I would go into small town journalism and get paid $10 an hour. And, you know, like my response to her was like, you're right. Like that's an amazing form of activism, but this is what I'm better suited to do. You know what I, I mean? I, I disagree with that because I believe you're at the level now where you can reach a vast majority, but still be, a, I guess, approachable. Mm-hmm. That it's still, I mean, a small town paper or whatever it is, you're going to meet what a, a thousand, a couple thousand people. Yeah. The podcast. I mean that it's limitless. Yeah, but I, I, that, yeah, I mean, but still, I think, I mean, now I'm like taking the side of this woman who hates the podcast, (laughs) (laughs) but um, not to be, um, not to just play devil's advocate here, but I do think that, um, like, I do think that is like a cool form of activism, uh, meaning bipartisan activism, just to be a small town journalist. I think small town journalism right. is like totally necessary, and I do think that's really cool. I just, it's it's just the same response that I would give to you about the Colin Kaepernick thing, of the fact that like I think you need both, right? Like I think we need to understand that we need kind of all levels. I guess this feels appropriate because you know you're saying. You love the podcast. You love it as a form of activism, and yet still, there is <laughs> there is something we disagree on. <laughs> and I mean, I, and I think one of my biggest things is that it, it's that should be okay. George, any any questions you have for me? Concerns, critiques, uh, things you want to say? Well, let me let me ask you this: What is your take on what's going on in Berkeley? In Berkeley. Um, I don't believe in blocking people from speaking places. Um, and, and to be clear of why is, is that because that could so easily be turned around against the other group, right? Yes. Then when the other group um, is trying to speak, then the other side could be like, well, we're going to silence you um, because we think what you're saying is, full, is bullshit. I do think that the First Amendment uh, is... It can be very much abused by people, um, especially in online spaces and through death threats and rape threats and harassment and um, and all of that stuff. So, like, okay, let me put it this way. I am a firm, firm, firm supporter of the First Amendment, but I think it should come with like a little extra clause that's like, you have the freedom of speech as long as you're going to like match that equally to how much you listen. Like if you legally were bound to whenever you said anything you wanted, you had to hear, uh, an opposing viewpoint of that or an alternate perspective, I think the world would be a radically different place. I completely agree with you. <laughs> well, great. 
Look at that. Oh my God. Look at us agreeing. We're, we're tying up this conversation into a nice little ribbon. Um, well, George, um, I guess thank you so much for the kind words you said about the podcast. Thank you for listening. Um, I am truly uh, humbled at the idea that you think that this podcast is better than Colin Kaepernick's uh, <laughs> <laughs> protest. I also humbly uh, disagree. Um, uh, but I, um, either way, I just want to say that it's been a pleasure talking to you. It has been a bit pleasure. I appreciate the phone call. Um, well, George, uh, have a great night, and I'll talk to you soon, okay? I appreciate it. You too. All right. Have a good one, George. Bye. Bye. Well, that's it for now. If you like this show, share it with your friends and tell the world about it. And if you feel you have the energy and can do it safely, have a difficult conversation of your own and let it be awkward. That kind of means it's working. Just keep in mind that one conversation won't immediately fix everything, or maybe anything, but it's a start. I'm Dylan Marin, and it has been an honor to make this show for you. Thanks so much for listening, and stay tuned for more to come. Conversations with People Who Hate Me is a production of Night Vale Presents. Christy Gressman is the executive producer. Vincent Cascione is the sound engineer and mixer. Alan Rahimic is the production manager. The theme song is These Dark Times by Caged Animals. The logo was designed by Rob Wilson. And this podcast was created, produced, and hosted by me, Dylan Marin. Special thanks to Night Vale Presents Director of Marketing, Adam Cecil, our publicist, Christine Ragasa, and also Dustin Flannery McCoy, Rob Silcox, Mark Maloney, and production assistants, Allison Goldberger and Emily Moeller. Thank you to all of those who gave encouragement throughout this process, and also thank you to those who warned me against doing this project. I did it anyway. And yes, thank you to those who wrote the hateful messages, comments, and posts that inspired me to turn one-way negativity into productive two-way conversations. Thank you so much for listening. If you love this show, tell all of your friends about it. And if you hated this show, maybe write to me. Tell me why you hated it. And who knows, maybe you'll be a guest on the show. Just remember, there is a human on the other side of the screen. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah. And it's about uh, the song in your outro. Yeah. Why did you pick that song? So the title is called These Dark Times. Mm-hmm. And it's written by Vin, who is uh, my audio producer, who basically makes it sound all good and stuff, even from a Skype recording. I picked it because, one, I loved the tune. Like, I could not get the tune out of my head. Um, And also because the lyrics, I felt like, got to kind of the crux of why I was doing this podcast, which is, you know, the refrain is that we'll make it through these dark times. And it feels like these are very dark times, right? Um, For me, at least. Um, And I feel like... The fact that it's like, we'll make it through these dark times, that it's the first person plural, um, is beautiful. And maybe a bunch of listeners right now are like, oh my god, this is the cheesiest shit I've ever heard. But um, I feel that. And I feel like um, it is going to have to take all of us to make progress Mm -hmm. together, even the people who we feel opposed to. I don't, I don't know, something makes me uncomfortable with saying these are dark times Mm -hmm. because I feel like uh, now more than ever, Mm -hmm. we have, uh, we, we have available all uh, the the most candles and Mm -hmm. lanterns Mm -hmm. and uh, any different light sources that Mm -hmm. we, Mm -hmm. we we had ever had in the whole history of humanity. Uh And maybe we are just pointing them in the wrong direction. I feel like your podcast is kind of like uh, signaling, hey, that way. <laughs> you, the dude with the, with, the, with the light, that way.
Learn to switch off all our fears and let go But late at night there are two evil twins in us They're just two curious Ooh, we're racing, racing through these dark Dark times. I wanna make it out alive from my hometown. I wanna take a ride and feel my heart pound. Ooh, we're racing, racing through these dark times. Ooh, we're fading, fading. Dark times.